Good morning and welcome to this service of Paul Matins here at Lincoln. I'm leading this act of worship from the historic 14th century chapel, which was built for the private devotions of Catherine Swinford. And across a, a, another part of Minster Yard in one of the households, our choral scholars are joining and producing the choral music this morning. And we'll be following the order of service according to the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dearly beloved, the scripture moved us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness and that we should not dissemble or cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and a humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no help in us, but thou, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and good, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, open thou our lips. And our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. 
reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, 
but the word of our God will stand for ever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. Here ends the first lesson. Reading from Peter, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, as an elder myself, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you to tend the flock of God that is in your charge, exercising the oversight not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do it. Not for sordid gain, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. 
and all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. God, 
the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence ye shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit, let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Of our enemies, that we, 
Surely trusting in thy defence may not be the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we may fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth. Most heartily we beseech you with thy favour to behold our most gracious sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, and so replenish her with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that she may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue her plenteously with heavenly gifts. Grant her in health and wealth long to live. Strengthen her that she may vanquish and overcome all her enemies. And finally, after this life, she may attain everlasting joy and felicity through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech you to bless Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit, enrich them with thy heavenly grace, and prosper them with all happiness. And bring them to thine everlasting kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone worketh great marvels, Send down upon our bishops and curates, and all congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, 
for the honour of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and has promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfil now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us all, evermore. Amen. Amen. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The six verses of Psalm 23 are some of the most familiar in the Bible, known to many through either the language of the Book of Common Prayer or set to the tune Crimond. The Psalm's attraction lies undoubtedly in the beauty of its words, the striking and the accessible image of the shepherd, and the fact that ultimately it's a great statement of trust, a testimony to the life of faith. The psalm, though, is not unduly sentimental and does not step back from expressing the realities of the life that we all know and live, speaking as it does of the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death and the ever-present realities of enemies close at hand. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. However, even when things are dark in that valley of the shadow of death, in the place of deepest darkness, God the Shepherd is there, with us to defend and comfort us with rod and staff. For Christians, of course, Jesus is that shepherd, the good shepherd, the shepherd upon whom we cast our anxieties because he cares for each one of us. And Christ, the good shepherd, is just that, as he knows us by name, loves us, takes us by the hand, and most profoundly, he lays down his life for the sake of the sheep. The image of the shepherd, of course, is used in the Psalms, but across the whole of Scripture. In the Old Testament, the example is that of the shepherd king, to a large extent the model set by King David a template by which other kings of Israel were judged. Some were seen to have led their nation well and wisely, others fall well short of the mark. But the example of the shepherd, the example of the good shepherd, is not just there for leaders and for kings, it's there for each and every one of us and for us as a church community as well. It's there as an example of how we can lead and guide one another, example of how we can include one another, care for one another, forgive one another, look after those who have gone astray. Putting all that together creates the image, of course, of a utopian paradise where we're nice to each other all the time. And although that would be good, I'm probably too much of a realist and somewhat argue a cynic to say that that is actually a reality, at least in this world and in this life. 
but I do nonetheless hope that we can open our hearts and our minds to the possibility, the possibility of a world, a nation, possibility of communities where we acknowledge that we need one another to flourish. We need one another and we are dependent upon one another. One of the ironies of our present situation, locked down and unable to meet one another, is actually realising our complete dependence on one another. Dependence on those who provide our daily bread, quite literally bringing it to our doorsteps. Dependence on those who are agents of healing, and wholeness, dependence on scientists, dependence on those who lead and direct our nation and the nations of the world. We are deeply dependent on one another. It's brought into sharp focus that no man can live for himself, no woman for herself, no nation by itself. In God's world, we simply cannot ignore one another. We cannot ignore the cries of our fellow human beings. And if we do ignore them, we diminish ourselves. So in our isolation, in our quiet, private prayers, we place before God with thanksgiving those whom, whom those on whom we are dependent, on those who depend on us. We pray for wisdom and for understanding, for justice and compassion, that together we may be led to green and abundant pastures, still and living water. And know in our hearts and souls the Good Shepherd who comes to each one of us, takes us by the hand and says, Peace be with you. And above everything, above nations and states, politicians and leaders, stands that Good Shepherd, the risen Christ, to whom all authority has been given and to whom all who lead in the church and in the world must render account. And this is no sentimental figure, nobody who comes to us meek and mild, but a good shepherd who lays down his life for his people. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen.
the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.